ever said. Life was fair, Tina. I'm bigger and I'm faster. I will always beat you. Faye Dunaway as actress Joan Crawford berating her daughter in Mommy Dearest, one of five new movies we'll be reviewing on this season premiere program of Sneak Previews, two critics talking about the latest movies in town. Across the aisle from me, back from summer vacation, Roger Ebert, film critic of the Chicago Sun-Times. And across the aisle from me, Gene Sisko, film critic of the Chicago Tribune. In addition to Mommy Dearest, we'll also be reviewing Neil Simon's new film, Only When I Laugh, William Hurt in the steamy drama Body Heat, and Jill Clayburgh as the first woman appointed to the United States Supreme Court in first Monday in October. Now Gene starts with Continental Divide, a newspaper film that was partly photographed at the Chicago Sun-Times, where I work. Connell Divide is a charming bit of fluff, a modern-day romance between a hard-driving, chain-smoking Chicago newspaper columnist, played by John Belushi, and a free-spirited Wyoming mountaintop scientist, played by Blair Brown. <laughs> Belushi's political columns have gotten him in trouble early in the picture with a crooked alderman, and his editor decides that it would be a good idea for Belushi to get out of town for a while, <laughs> so he ends up sending him to Wyoming to interview Blair Brown, who is doing research and trying to protect the American bald eagle. Ernie Suchak, the Belushi character, is not the outdoor type. He's out <laughs> of shape. He can barely struggle up the mountain to look at some of Brown's eagles. How you doing, Mr. Suchak? Just great. Just great. This is so much fun. You know, I should get out more. Be careful around these rocks. Oh, no problem. <laughs> Do you want to rest for a bit? No, 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 not me. I'm fine. I can go all day. I'd like to get this broad in a bowling alley. Jeez. When I was up here last spring, they had two eaglets, Bruno and Sarah. I just hope Sarah didn't murder her brother. They do that? Mm, to get his food. Really? The young female is dominant. Whoa! It's nature's way. It's all very nice up on the mountaintop. Belushi and Brown fall in love, but eventually Belushi has to return to Chicago to start writing his political column again. Brown comes to Chicago, and this time it's his turn to show her his home. He has a cynical affection for the big city. To live in Chicago, you have to learn that you only survive by understanding your opponent, Dr. Porter. First, you have to remember the number. 911. That's the police. Now the line will be busy because the rest of Chicago is trying to survive just like you are. Hi, Fiddle. Second, never touch anyone on the street. They'll think you need help and they'll kill you. And for God's sakes, never smile at anyone. They'll think you're gay, in which case, don't call 911. They'll book you for an obscene phone call. <laughs> the film is much better, I think, in its romantic and comedy scenes on the mountaintop than in its city scenes, which are really nothing special. The main pleasure, though, is Belushi's teddy bear-like charm. He's genuinely appealing in Continental Divide. It's one of his most restrained film performances. Another reason why the film works, I think, is that Belushi and Blair Brown are very likable as a couple. We're interested in how they're going to work out their cross-country two-career relationship. So it's a very nice film, and I mean that as a compliment. I think nice is a real nice word to apply to this yeah. film. I really, I also picked up on the chemistry between John Belushi and Blair Brown, who are both sort of unconventional, and yet they have that movie star charisma that we remember from uh, Tracy and Hepburn, and of course this movie has been compared to the movies that Tracy and Hepburn made 30 years ago. Kind of a tough, 
combative relationship, the woman who's not going to just want to be a homemaker and the guy who has never been in love before and they're both kind of feeling their way. Mm -hmm. I really liked the chemistry and the, the movie was, was warm. It was kind of fuzzy and funny and I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, I think it's nice to have a picture sometimes just work on that level. It's pleasant. It's not attempting to be anything particularly great, uh, but it does achieve a friendly quality. It's a nice place to spend a couple hours. Since they shot part of it at the Chicago Sun-Times, I suppose I should address the question of whether this is an accurate portrait of a Sun-Times columnist. And, I mean, here's a guy who walks with a beautiful girl at the side of Lake Michigan with the towers of the city behind him at dusk. I thought it was right on target. Well, that's my life, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Neil Simon was already the most successful comic playwright in Broadway history when in 1970 he wrote his first serious play, The Gingerbread Lady. Now that play has been recycled into a movie called Only When I Laugh. It stars Simon's wife, Marcia Mason, as a recovering alcoholic who has just been discharged from a rehabilitation program. Now she's trying to pick up the threads of her damaged relationship with her daughter, played by Christy McNichol. McNichol's been living with her father for the past few years. Now she moves in with Mason. And in this scene, McNichol tries to pick up a couple of cute teenage guys in a restaurant by pretending her mother is her sister. Okay, if we share this table? Sure. Excuse me, but do you know where McDougal Street is? Mm, McDougal Street? We're not that familiar with New York. We're supposed to go to this party tonight on McDougal Street, but we don't know where it is. It's downtown in the West Village. Oh, the West Village, right. Thanks a lot. You into health foods? No, I'm not into them. I just eat them. Uh, you live in New York? Well, our parents live in Paris. But we go to school here. Columbia. Studying journalism. I'm a freshman. I'm a senior. Yeah. I thought you were the older one. This party tonight is kind of loose, you know? If you guys would like to drop by, I'm sure my friend would be glad to have you. Well, I don't know. What do you think, Carol? Carol. Me? Oh, uh, I can't. I have that paper to get out tonight. Oh, yes. Listen, Polly, we have to go. Why? Because Dad is calling from overseas at 6. You guys will excuse us. We're going to be in town over the weekend. This is there weekend? any place we can get in touch with you? Yeah. Uh, we don't have a phone. Uh, they're tearing our dorm down. We're, we're uh, trying to find another one. It was awfully nice meeting you. Wow. Did you say goodbye, Carol? I said it. I said it. Can we please go? Will you move? I could go to jail for this. I really don't relate to that scene at all. Somehow a scene like that doesn't belong in a movie with serious pretensions. It's pure sitcom. It's recycled out of I Love Lucy. But the movie alternates dumb scenes like that with emotional confrontations that seem inspired by daytime soap opera. For example, later in the film, at a party, Marsha Mason starts drinking again and her daughter reacts in anger. Everybody always takes care of Georgia. Stop it, Polly. Stop it. Then make me. Do something about it. You're a mother. Why don't you act like one? All right. We'll talk about this at home. No. Let's talk about it now. Let's talk about all the years I didn't get from you. Where were you, mother? And don't tell me your problems, because I don't care about them. It's all I've heard since I was four years old. Every time I got sick, I used to pray that I would die, just so you'd break down at my funeral and beg me to forgive you. Well, I don't want your forgiveness. And I'm not going to die just to get something from you. Because I don't think you're worth dying over. You asked me the other night how I really felt about you. I was so angry at you for never being around when I really needed someone. Well, you're around now, aren't you? And it sure as hell is a disappointment to find out that I was better off when you weren't around. Holly, I no, I don't give a damn. Christy McNichol is good there. She's a forceful young actress. The problem with Only When I Laugh isn't in the performances, but in Neil Simon's screenplay. He seems to be unwilling to deal seriously with his serious subjects. For example, James Coco plays a lonely homosexual in this film, but we never meet his lover. Joan Hackett plays a woman rejected by her husband, but we never meet her husband. And as for Marcia Mason's alcoholism, instead of dealing with the disease in realistic terms, Simon just gives us one more stereotype theatrical drunk surrounded by a cheering section of her neurotic friends encouraging her self-pity. I, I really dislike this film. I dislike it too, and I think we agree on the source of the problem, Neil Simon's script. It is this basic. 
The characters are not believable. When I see these two people talking, I see the writer. Mm -hmm. These are characters, these are actors mouthing lines. Only Christy McNichol, in that scene particularly, gives a little of the fire of a young person mm -hmm. feeling unhappy with a parent. But that comes from her, not from those words. The words are garbage, I think. You know, it seems as if Simon really doesn't want to get involved with these people and really probe their problems as a serious dramatist mm -hmm. would, and as he claims to be doing here. Instead, mm -hmm. he gives us lots of shtick, you know. In less than 24 hours in this movie, Christy McNichol herself goes out and get drunk, gets drunk. Marsha Mason goes out, picks up a guy in a bar. She gets raped, uh, raped and beaten up. It's as if, as long as there's always something exciting happening on the screen, we don't have to stop and really look at these It's characters. a very phony drama. Mm -hmm. Our next film is a lot better, I think, Body Heat. It's my kind of movie, stylish, menacing, sensual, constantly entertaining. This film, Body Heat, was written by Lawrence Kasdan, the same person who wrote the John Belushi film we just discussed a minute ago, Connell Divide. So, I think this is a sneak preview's first two films by one writer on the same show, and I like them both. Body Heat is set in a sweltering Florida resort town. William Hurt stars as a bachelor attorney who is drawn into a murderous web spun by a slick femme fatale played by Kathleen Turner. She's unhappily married to a wealthy businessman, and after one brief encounter, Hurt spots her again at one of her regular hangouts, a bar full of single men. How'd you find me, Ned? <gasps> this is the only joint in Pine Haven. You shouldn't have come. You're going to be disappointed. What did I do? A lot of them have tried that seat. You're the first I've let stay. You must come here a lot. <sighs> Most men are little boys. Maybe you should drink at home. It's too quiet. Maybe you shouldn't dress like that. This is a blouse and skirt. I don't know what you're talking about. You shouldn't wear that body. Sometimes I don't know. I just get so sick of everything, I'm not sure I care anymore. Do you know what I mean, Ned? I know that sometimes it comes down so heavy, I feel like I should wear a hat. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. I'm gonna get out of here. I gotta go home. I'll take you. I have a car. I'll follow you. He does follow her home, but when they get there, she doesn't want him to stay. It's a great movie moment, <laughs> great music and image. Their relationship does take off, but what is not said in all of its highly charged emotionalism is the problem of what to do with her husband, who is out of town a lot. Turner visits Hurt in his office, and their plans begin to take shape. I'm afraid of him, Ned. I'm That's always afraid. Good. You have to be very careful now about the phones. Why, Ned? Why do you say this we now? could account for a couple of calls. We've had some contact. That would make sense. Why, Ned? What's happened? Kill him. We both know that. It's what you want, isn't it? We knew it was coming. It's the only way we can have everything we want, isn't it?
doesn't deserve it. Let's not ever say that. You're doing it for us, and you'll inherit half of everything he owns. That's what the will says, right? Oh, that's it, then. That's it. We're gonna kill him. And I think I know how. It's real, Ben. It's real, all right. There's a powerful mood of danger throughout Body Heat as we watch both characters knowingly do things they know mm. they should not do. <laughs> Body Heat is a solid adult movie-going experience, crisply written, very well acted. I loved it. I was sitting there. I was following this movie every twist, every turn. Sure. Is it a double cross? Is it a triple cross? Mm -hmm. Is it a double cross back away I didn't suspect before? I just loved the intricacy of the plot. It's like a clockwork uh, uh, piece of fiction. Well, it is good. Walking out of the theater, I was thinking of things that happened in the first mm -hmm. half hour of the film and how they all fit with things that happened at the end. It's, it, was, it was a lot of fun. It yeah. was intellectually challenging. But I didn't care how it turned out. And I well, really wasn't sitting there thinking, you know, what, which way is it going to go. Mm -hmm. I liked it in the moment. I like those scenes. I don't care. In the best mysteries, it isn't the mystery. It's mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. turning through the, the, the plot. It's all of that. It's mm -hmm. the music. It's the the, the photography, mood. the costumes, also the passion, the sexuality. Also coming out of a very uh, lame brain kind of summer season of movies. This uh -huh. was adult and strong, and I liked it a lot. So far, it's on my list of the year's 10 best. Mine I don't too. know what the fall still has to offer. But for one of the most entertaining movies of the year, let's move on to one of the least entertaining and most painful movies of the year. The film is Mommy Dearest, starring Faye Dunaway in an unremittingly unpleasant portrait of movie star Joan Crawford. The movie's based, of course, on the best-selling book by Christina Crawford, Joan's adopted daughter, who characterizes Crawford as a cruel, jealous, domineering mother who made her children's lives hell on earth. Well, is this portrait an accurate one? I don't know. I have no way of knowing. But the movie wages into Crawford's life with a vengeance, showing as a movie star in crisis. She's growing older. Her films are losing money. She's about to be fired from MGM. And worst of all, her daughter is a naughty little girl. <laughs> in this scene, Joan Crawford arrives at a restaurant and is summoned by studio chief Louis B. Mayer for a command performance. They will be, what a pleasant surprise. Yeah, I, I want you to meet a few financial friends from New York. They're bankers. Mr. Lubin? It's a pleasure. Mr. Dodd? Mr. Dodd? Please sit down, join us. <laughs> My daughter, Ellen, would love to have your signature, Miss well, Crawford. Of course. You see, she didn't ask for L.B. Mayer's signature. That's because she's not as smart as her father. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> she doesn't know that you are the king. Thank you, Dad. Where are you going? Come join us. We're having dinner. You're one of the reasons bankers love Metro. <laughs> no. Thank you, LB, but our table is ready. I insist. You're aces, Joey. Glad you think that, LB, because aces be king. <laughs> <laughs> Not in Hollywood, dear. <laughs> <laughs> you really see the anger beneath the surface there. The movie portrays Crawford as an alcoholic and a manic depressive, celebrating an Oscar victory in one scene and whipping her daughter in the next scene. This film lingers on the mistreatment of the little girl in scene after scene until I began to feel really creepy watching uh, Crawford whip Christina with a coat hanger, hit her with a can of babbo, chop off her hair with a scissors, try to strangle her to death, and yet in public, of course, Crawford was an ideal mother, as this smarmy Christmas scene illustrates. All of America knows of your generosity in adopting these two homeless children. And might I say to all of our listeners, they're beautifully behaved. Thank you, George. I feel that discipline mixed with love is such a good recipe. Christina, do you and your brother get lots of presents at Christmas time? Yes, we do. Mother's fans send us so many beautiful things but we like to share them with other boys and girls who aren't so fortunate. Miss Crawford, could you tell us what will happen after we leave you this evening? Oh, the children and I will probably sit and watch the Christmas tree lights, and then later we'll welcome some of the children's friends to help us sing Christmas carols. And surely you'll finish up by reading Twas the Night Before Christmas? No Christmas Eve would be complete without that. Well. As a Christmas present to our listeners, would all of you like to say the last two lines? And I heard him exclaim as he drove out of sight, 
Merry Christmas to all, and to all a good night. A happy little Hollywood scene with unbelievable tension underneath. What made Joan Crawford run? This movie never says. There's no explanation for the star's cruelty toward her child, not even the kind of bargain basement Freudianism that Hollywood usually throws in for free. Mommy Dearest is like a nasty gossip column, and it's all the more disappointing because it is a well-made film. Mm -hmm. Faye Dunaway is uncanny in her performance as Crawford. It's like watching a ghost to see her on the screen, especially in that scene. The sets and costumes, the limousines and homes and swimming pools are all absolutely faithful to our notions of Hollywood glamour, but Mommy Dearest is basically just a pointless record of neurotic child abuse, one of the most depressing films in a long time. I agree with you. Well made, but depressing. The way the film has been structured, you sit mm -hmm. there and wait for the beating scenes. And when you're in the audience thinking that, you sort of feel lousy. Mm -hmm. I like the film a little bit more than you for the following reason. Mm -hmm. I thought that the film didn't explain Crawford, as you mentioned, but I did think the film was a pretty good portrait of the kid's reaction. Mm -hmm. uh, Christina Crawford is played at two ages, a nine-year-old by that mm -hmm. little girl, and then later on by Diana Scarwood mm -hmm. uh, as, in a, as a woman in her 20s. Mm -hmm. And both characters, I think, portray the pain and really make you feel some of that that the kid suffers. Sure you so do. part of the film works at that level. Sure you do, but why do you want to know that? First of all, we don't know if it's true about Joan Crawford, and if it is, why is that the only aspect of this film that makes the film commercial, the fact that it's about child abuse? Why is it that they felt that anybody who would want to, I can't imagine who would want to see this film. Well, you would want to see the subject treated well. Yeah. I think that's the case. They didn't treat it well. Mm -hmm. And I think you're right. They don't explain why she's doing it. You sit there, and then it becomes a crass kind of a thing. So that's really the, an ordeal. That's the problem with the film. Let's go on to our next picture. I hated First Monday in October, our next <laughs> film, from start to finish, for a very simple reason. I could not accept either of its leading characters, Walter Matthau or Jill Clayburgh, in their roles as bickering Supreme Court justices. Matthau plays a liberal judge, supposedly modeled after the late William O. Douglas, the champion of unlimited free speech. Jill Clayburgh plays a conservative justice and the first woman appointed to the high court. The two of them clash, and in this scene, argue about a pornography case involving a skin flick. Their stilted method of argument is that Clayburgh asks Matthau to take the witness stand, play the dirty filmmaker, and then she questions him as if he and his ideas were on trial. Have you been to New York lately? Times Square, 44th, 45th Street. Used to be a decent place to visit. Unforgettable music, powerful plays. Today, right around the corner on 8th Avenue, your picture's probably playing alongside a lot of other pornography and filth. Watch out, lady. Scratch me, put me out of business, and who else gets scratched? The same end of the eraser can wipe out your unforgettable music and your powerful plays. Oh, I'm glad I met you, Mr. Maloney. I feel I have a much better understanding of you and Justice Snow. He may want the absolute freedom to go straight to hell. That's his right. But he has no right to force the rest of the country to take the trip with him. You may step down. Yeah, you make a pretty good trial lawyer. Too bad you had to give it up. You make a very good actor. I may always have the feeling there's a pornographic producer under your robes. It makes me sick to my stomach to have to defend a principle as noble as the First Amendment on the basis of that can of film you found so offensive. But by God, as long as I have tongue and tonsils and the ability to talk, I'll defend everybody's right to speak and every man's right to be wrong. I yield to you as the authority on that, Mr. Justice. Sorry, but that's not my idea of two people discussing legal issues. That's two Hollywood stars reciting dialogue originally written for the stage. Both Matthau and Clayburgh are thoroughly unconvincing as Supreme Court justices, and the movie never gives us any insight into the Supreme Court. We never see the judges make a single decision on a single issue. So first Monday in October is lightweight, badly acted, and really an intellectually gutless motion picture. Here, here. You know, they really had two ways they could go with this. They could go uh, for the intellectual arguments and philosophical discussions, or they could go with the human interest. Somehow this movie managed to go right down the middle <laughs> and to miss both sides. Right. Uh, at one point, Matthau's wife leaves, and we yeah. think he'll fall in love with Jill Clayburgh. That yeah. leads up to one, count it, one chaste kiss on the cheek. Uh -huh. And as for the philosophical discussions, we just saw those. They're about on a level with... Uh, high school civics yeah. class. The movie's a mess. Yes, and here's one thing, an interesting movie point. Jill Clayburgh is well known for playing emancipated women, mm -hmm. strong women characters. You see her saying that dialogue 
Can't believe it. Can't believe mm -hmm. a word. Now, either she isn't a good enough actress, which I doubt, mm -hmm. or it's just totally horrible casting and she shouldn't have even entered into the role. Bad film. Well, they brought the movie out at this time, I suppose, because of the recent appointment to the Supreme Court. Maybe that'll sell three tickets. I don't know. <laughs> well, now that's the signal for <laughs> some movies that aren't even worth three hey, tickets. Sparky, come on. And we come have on. a little bit of surprise. We're introducing Sparky the Wonder Dog. <laughs> that's right. Spot the Wonder Dog got a little tired, and we have seen all those lousy pictures. So here's Sparky the Wonder Dog. Welcome to one of the roughest jobs in television. Listen, kid, you're really going to earn your dog biscuits on this one. My dog this week. Uh, starts out the new season one of the very worst, most inept, most technically idiotic movies I've <laughs> ever seen. It's called Hollywood High Part 2. This is about teenagers who spend most of their day goofing off at school or playing ball on the beach. A lot of this movie doesn't even have dialogue. The soundtrack consists of recycled teenage surf party hits stolen from the bottom 40. <laughs> Every once in a while, a kid will say, hey, gang, let's cruise down Hollywood Boulevard. And then what do we get? We get Chamber of Commerce footage of all the bright lights of Hollywood <laughs> Boulevard, but you can't see any of the characters of the movie anywhere. <laughs> Hollywood High Part 2. Remember the name? Beware the film. That's too bad. I like the title. <laughs> My dog this week is Choo Choo and the Philly Flash. <laughs> a big budget picture. It's a self-indulgent comedy starring Carol Burnett and Alan Arkin as a couple of San Francisco drifters who stumble across a suitcase containing government secrets. Burnett plays a Carmen Miranda-style entertainer Arkin is a street hobo known as the Philly Flash. Why? Because he was once a star baseball player, we're supposed to believe, with the Philadelphia Phillies. <laughs> All there is to the film is a series of mindless car chases and Burnett and Arkin mugging for the camera. I didn't laugh once in this film. In fact, it was genuine agony to have to sit through it. My sympathy, Gene. So much for the dogs. Now let's take another look at the main movies on this program. We agree on Continental Divide, the romantic comedy starring John Belushi and Blair Brown. It's rated PG. We thought it was warm and funny. We both recommend you see it. That's why there's a yes after both of our names. Two no votes, though, for Only When I Laugh, with Marsha Mason as a mixed-up alcoholic. It's triviality masquerading as seriousness. We can't recommend you see this film. Two big yes votes for Body Heat, the chilling thriller starring William Hurt as a man in love, in heat, and in trouble. <laughs> but two disappointed no votes for Mommy Dearest, the portrait of Joan Crawford as a child abuser. Faye Dunaway is fine in her role, but the film is pointlessly depressing. And finally, two no votes on first Monday in October, a well-meaning but endlessly talkative comedy about the Supreme Court. So clearly the message is, go see Body Heat. I think, it, I think you're right. Yeah. Okay, that's all for this week. Next time on Sneak Previews, we'll review more new movies, including Carbon Copy, a new comedy with George Siegel as a father surprised by his newfound black son. Prince of the City with Treat Williams as a narcotics cop involved in police corruption and The French Lieutenant's Woman, starring Meryl Streep in the romantic title role. Until then, we'll see you at the movies. Funding for sneak previews was provided by this station and by other public television stations. Mm -hmm.